Uh, welcome to Florence. Uh, I'm Silvia Lucchesi. I'm the director of uh, Lo Schermo dell'Arte. And uh, we are here in uh, the Cinema La Compagnia. We are streaming from the stage of Cinema La Compagnia. We are with James Cramp, a friend of the festival, filmmaker. And we are going to talk about his la last film, uh, Speed Heart, who is Jordan Wolfson. Uh, this film ha was programmed in the festival program last November, and it, it, it's one of the most viewed film of the program. So we, we are happy to have the chance now to, to talk about, about this work with, with this filmmaker and author. And um, so uh, I read on your interview on, in, in, the, in your interview on fleshart.com, uh, that you first, uh, you started to track uh, Jordan Wilson work in 2013 and you had the chance to meet him uh, the first time in his studio in 2017. And my question is, what did impress you to eventually decide to make a film on him? Um, I met Jordan, we had a studio visit. My initial impressions were that he was just, he was very, very impressive. He was so articulate and he seemed so, uh, so commanding about what his practice is about and how he shared it with me. And um, I was just very impressed by the ideas that he shared about his art and um, the vision that he shared with me about where he was gonna go with his art. And then a few years later, over the, over the couple of years subsequent to that, I got the chance to, to spend time with Jordan and meet him, hang out with him. And I just learned a lot more about his, the idiosyncrasies of his, of his character. And I think that's what eventually led me to, to consider this as a motion picture. It just was such a um, entertaining, lively, amusing, um, I don't know, deprecating, uh, challenging personality, a very divisive personality. And I thought I wanted to put a, a mirror up to the, the condition of the contemporary art market, the hyper speculative uh, contemporary art mark. And I thought Jordan Wolfson was a perfect foil to do that. He's not quite, you know, uh, an emerging artist any longer. He's not really a, a mid-career a mid artist either. He's sort of in between. And I thought he's had some really wonderful successes. Wouldn't he be a great subject to, in a way, reflect on what the condition of the contemporary art market is today? And that's what, that's what got me motivated to do this film. Um, your previous films, uh, three long feature documentaries are uh, about uh, not living artists. I just mentioned the, the first one you did in 2007 about the, uh, the relations between uh, Robert Mappertorp and Sam Wagstaff. And then you did a film on the land art. And then you did a film that we presented uh, here in Florence on, uh, on the fashion designer Antonio Lopez. These are three characters, uh, strong personalities, uh, not living artists. Um, how has been the, the work with the living artists for the first time in your uh, movies? It's the first time I've, I've, I've uh, directed a film about a living artist in a verite style. And it, was, it presented new challenges that were, were welcome to me. I thought it would be an interesting opportunity to um, track an artist cinematically. And uh, when you're working with an artist who's no longer alive, there's, there's, far less, there's far less input, there's far less attempts at control. And so that was a major challenge in this motion picture was to, to be able to um, see my vision come to fruition. And um, well, well, I did welcome input from Jordan Wolfson. In the end, um, it was going to be a film produced in a way that I saw it being produced. But that presented challenges that so unlike the earlier films. So um, to answer your question, it was a, it was a real challenge. It was a real, it was a real uh, departure from my previous work. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I think the results speak for themselves. But um, I'm not saying I won't do another film like this, but uh, my next project is again about a, a, an architect who's no longer alive, Marcel Breuer. Yeah, I know about this new film. We look forward to, to viewing it. Working with documentaries in my life, I, I often thought that that the filmmaker can work uh, as a art critic or art historian. You are art historian, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, in Jordan Wolfson film, the approach is not historical, of course. Well, I, as an art historian and as a filmmaker, I'm always trying to create cinematic tension. I'm interested in stories that are art historical. And I, and I actually did approach this film in an art historical way insofar as I'm looking at one artist's output, I'm looking at one artist's practice, I'm trying to um, approach it in a critical way. It, you know, I never set out to make a film that was necessarily a, a pro or negative film about Jordan Wolfson. I really wanted to do something that was, that was honest and accurate, but I also wanted to inflect it with critical thinking and, and uh, critical juxtapositions. And that's, that's how we use, for instance, um, the work of this artist throughout the film, juxtaposing that with, uh, you know, responses to his work by people who know him very, very well, intimates, former girlfriends, family members, people who support his work, people who might take a more critical view of it. And so therefore it was in a way like the previous films art historically, except that I'm working with a, a living character in this, in this instance. But I did approach it art historically and uh, in a very critical way. I, I wanted to tease out the work. I wanted to open up questions about it uh, because the work is controversial, the work is divisive. I wanted to try to cinematically um, bring those issues to the foreground in, in the film itself. Um, and actually, uh, all the uh, characters you are interviewing, talking about him, they use a very strong uh, uh, words uh, talking about his art. Uh, I, I just noted a few a few ambitious, psycho, monster, provocateur, cruel. Uh, you, you also say in the interview on Flash Art uh, that, uh, that is uh, uh, manipulative, mercurial. Do you think that sometimes you, you, you live in a sort of a, a psycho, psychotherapic session with him? Well, there's several questions embedded in that particular question. I'll just say that um, the subjects that we chose were ones that actually, while they were critical in some instances, they're all people who appreciate and actually love Jordan Wolfson. When we were starting to make this film, Jordan actually was trying to uh, suggest a list of subjects, some of whom he called haters, people who don't like him at all. He also had a list of girlfriends he wanted me to talk to, and, uh, and as there are many. And so we chose, we chose a variety of people that we felt that would be able to, again, tease out the issues embedded in his work um, from a variety of different uh, perspectives. Um, the psychosexual aspect, I think, is really fascinating, uh, especially when you think about Erica John and her history, that she's his aunt. He actually says, he said it in interviews with me and elsewhere how she was influential, how she was a kind of mentor. She was someone who, for him as a young person, he looked up to in terms of her openness to sexuality, the idea of spending time in her apartment in New York City where, you know, volumes of, of books dealing with eroticism and sexuality and erotic art, et cetera, were available to him, which they were not available to him apparently in his own, in his own uh, childhood home. So that's very interesting. And then you have, you have the ex-girlfriend, Emma Fernberger, you have uh, Jordan Wolfson talking about his, uh, his gay adjacency with Jeremy O'Harris. So it goes back again, trying to make juxtapositions that reflect or somehow inform our perception of the work that he's been producing over the last say, you know, decade. I just, I want to, uh, to make a question about the, the, the organization of the production. Um, you, are, you, you, are, you have written and directed the film uh, that was produced by Ronnie Sassoon. Uh, she's an art historian too. And uh, you edited the film, and Ronnie also was on the editing. Uh, you did the cinematography, and Ronnie did the, the pro production design. It looks like that you, you are working with a very small team of, of people on, on your films. I think in this instance, uh, we started off with that. Uh, that was my idea was I wanted to be able to have this intimacy with the artist. He's a living, breathing character. And I wanted to be um, as live and to be able to, to be as flexible as possible. 
to move at, an, at a, a, you know, a moment's notice. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we chose to have such a small crew. It just gave us so much more flexibility. And I think that um, the way that we shot the film with not requiring you know, large numbers of people to support us really allowed me to um, get closer to Jordan, to gain his trust, to be able to elicit responses to my questions and for us to also, as you see in the film, to observe him in a very uh, cinema verite style, which was seemed very organic. And I think that's much more difficult to do when you have a large crew and you're working with larger, larger equipment, et cetera. So um, that, was, that was something we thought about from the beginning. It's also, it's, in a way, it's, it's a budgetary aspect as well. You're trying to make a film that has super high production values, but you're trying to do it on a budget that uh, is, you know, in, in today's film world is very, very lean by necessity. Uh, I, I noticed something that I try very, uh, that I find very very interesting in your interview on 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 flash art. Uh, you say that uh, now uh, after the Black Li Lives Matter protests and, and after the Me, the Me Too movement, uh, there is uh, I quote renewed recognition of the inequities in the in the art world. So my question is, uh, does a, a privileged uh, white man ar male artist like uh, as Jordan Wilson is risk being counseled from the art scene? Well, I think if you look at some, some particular works, for instance, uh, the colored sculpture piece, which is one of his last very important uh, animatronic works, where you have a, just a very, very loaded uh, three-dimensional work of art. The title is Colored Sculpture. The figure itself is this animatronic uh, doll, large format doll that, you know, when you look at it, it conjures up uh, for certain people. I mean, for me personally, it, uh, it conjures up through the, the titling, through the, uh, the gantry system that works, the chains, the way that the, the, the doll is actually abused and pushed around in this, in this sort of mise-en-scene. It, it conjures up uh, the history of slavery, the torturing of African-Americans. Um, and to, to call it colored sculpture was just, you know, and not have that addressed. I think uh, it raises issues for, for, you know, certain communities that are, are looking at this sculpture and asking themselves, what is, what is behind this work? What is, what's the intention? And in many instances, Jordan Wolfson as an artist doesn't address those issues. He puts those, those works out into the world, leaving uh, meaning to be defined by the viewer. And I think that's, that's perhaps the, the risk that he takes as a white, you know, privileged male artist in today's market after the, uh, in, the, in the wake of Black Lives Matter. Um, the very last question, which is not a real question, I'm looking on in the on the internet about about his work. I found out that he, he will have a, a solo show in 2000, 2022 uh, in Rivoli at the Castello di Rivoli. I know that you are a collector also, and you collect arte povera. How do you think that the, his cinematronic work and, and contro this controversial figure will be in the kingdom of the arte povera? It's an interesting question. I mean, when that acquisition was made by uh, Castello de Riboli, I, I was very surprised by it because it, you know, on the surface of it, it doesn't seem like a work of art that would necessarily fit into that collection or the history of that institution. But I think the director of the museum uh, has, has expressed you know, the, the, the motivations behind it. Um, one of the things I read was that uh, she feels that a European audience is much more open, much less critical, or at least um, won't have the kind of uh, what we would call here in the States, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to this work called real violence, which is a, a, a virtual reality work which is very, very a very, very controversial work that was uh, premiered at the Whitney Museum at the uh, 2017 Biennale. Um, so I, mean, I think it would be interesting in the context of Arte Pover, I don't really see the connections necessarily. <laughs> it, 
that when you look at the history of Arta Povera, you think about materiality, you think about the subject matter of Arta Povera works, um, it, it might create an, you know, an interesting juxtaposition. There's been other artists that they've, that they've featured there, for instance, uh, Maurizio Catalan. I've seen installation views of his work in that, in that uh, wonderful institution and, and uh, that made very, very beautiful, very compelling juxtapositions with the architecture and with the, um, the art held within. So I thank you very much, uh, James, for, for this short interview. And uh, I, I hope we will see very soon, maybe next year, hopefully next year here at Cinema La Compagnia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And thank uh, Los Guillermo Dell'Arte for all of the support over the years.